Good morning, siblings in Christ. This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It is my privilege to welcome you to this morning celebration of World Communion Sunday. I greet you this day on behalf of my colleagues, Reverend Audrey Price and Reverend Marvin Silver and your sister congregations, who with you are the Central Atlantic Conference of the United Church of Christ. I extend not only a special welcome, but gratitude to the Reverend Dr. Karen Georgia Thompson, who is with us today and who will undoubtedly share a word from the Lord. And I also want to especially thank all of those who have come together to both plan and participate in this special day in the life of our church. A short but particularly meaningful psalm begins with this exclamation, how good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. Today's service, the result of Potomac Association congregations from throughout the DMV, as colloquially, colloquially known, coming together, punctuates the profundity of the psalmist statement. For not only is our coming together to celebrate the Lord's Supper a reminder of our kinship as members of the body of Christ, it's an important statement to make, a profound one, in these days that are so marked by division, by partisanship, by humanly contrived schisms. This unity that we proclaim today is the place where God, according to the psalmist, ordains God's blessing forevermore. And this coming together is not only good and pleasant, it is divine. And this coming together this day in worship brings joy to my soul. So with that joy, and borrowing from the Baptist upbringing of my childhood, I welcome you once, I welcome you twice, I welcome you three times in the name of Jesus Christ. And may God bless the unity with which we worship this day. God, our creator, who calls each by name, we thank you for this place we call home, for the waterways that sustain us, for the winged beings that declare your glory. And for the beauty of this world, we pray, help us to tend it. God of the ancient ones who walked this land lightly long ago, and still today, we give thanks for our native and indigenous siblings. God of those rooted in the mother continent who were brought to this land in chains and brutally enslaved. We give thanks for the survival of all of those of African descent. God of immigrants, the desperate ones, as well as the colonizers who saw others land as their own. We thank you for the beauty of new shores and we lament the violence and hatred visited here. We acknowledge that the stories of these ancestors live in us. Their hopes and dreams run through our veins. We are their answered prayer. And yet their trauma, secrets, and dysfunctions were handed down to us. Help us to do better. Help us to unlearn their broken ways. To expand our embrace of the human family. On this World Communion Sunday, we pray that you will create in us a clean heart and renew within us a right spirit. We invite your spirit into this moment of worship, knowing we cannot do this work alone, and trusting in your promise that wherever two or three are gathered, there you will be in our midst, unsettling us with new truths, cleansing us with the wind of your spirit, forgiving us into repair. We pray all of this in the name of the one who conquered even death, the precious and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Here in this 
darkest place, the light is streaming, now is the darkness vanished away. See in this place of fears and our dreaming, what do to you in the light of this Good morning and welcome to World Communion Day. I am Minister Robert Bobby Faison. I serve as the moderator for the Potomac Association of the Central Atlantic Conference of the United Church of Christ. I also serve as the executive minister at the Community Church of Washington, D.C., United Church of Christ. And most recently and currently, I also serve as the minister of faith formation and mission at Emmaus United Church of Christ. And I am here today on behalf of our youth and with a children's message. Have you ever been in a situation where you have trouble remembering things? Of course you do. We all do. Children have not changed much since I was your age, since I was young, really young, like you are today. I can remember when I was a boy, my mother would ask me, did you clean your room? I would always answer, oh, I forgot, Ma." Or she might ask me, did you take out the trash like I told you to? I forgot was my usual reply. I still have trouble remembering now that I'm grown and I'm really grown now. I'm always forgetting something that I was supposed to do. Perhaps in a lot of ways, we have created stuff to help us to kind of remember things. One of the oldest memory tricks that I remember when I was a child is where you would actually get a piece of string or a piece of ribbon and tie it around your finger and then when you tie it around your finger, it served as a memory to remind you that you needed to do something. But you know what would happen sometimes? I would forget why I tied the string or the ribbon around my finger. So then sometimes I would go to the point of where I would write stuff on my hand. And some people still do that even today, where they may write a reminder on the palm of their hand. But then some people are like, no, I don't want to be writing on my hand. So then we go to the point where we are actually using post-it notes now, where we write stuff on notes. But sometimes the issue is we might even forget after we've written the reminder on the post-it note where we put the post-it note at. So then now in our 2020 generation, we've even gotten electronic. So I actually have a Kindle um, that you can also put reminders on as well. Or some people may be more comfortable with the iPad. I have one of those too. But you know, sometimes I even forget to charge my iPad so I can never look at the display. I can't even really look at my iPad right now because I didn't charge it last night. And so uh, I can't charge it this morning because I didn't bring my charger with me. But I have this device that will help me for today. Now, when we think about this idea of being forgetful, we also are thankful that God, through Jesus Christ, created a way for us to remember, especially remembering the Lord's Supper, remembering communion. 
the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was eating with his disciples. He knew that he would soon return to his father in heaven. He wanted to make sure that his disciples remember him after he was gone. So he did something that would help them to remember. As they were eating, he took a piece of bread and he broke it and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And then he also took a glass of wine and then he held it up and said, this is my blood, which is shed for you. When you drink it, remember. Now, you know what? It's been at least 2000 years since that night. And we still use that same way to remember Jesus, whether it be the bread, whether it be the wine or whatever we use as symbols of bread and wine in this 2020 generation. When we take communion, we eat the bread and drink the cup to remind us that Jesus suffered and died on the cross so that we might have life. As we eat the bread and drink from the cup today, we remember Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me, young people? Dear Jesus, we remember you today. Remember that your body was broken and your blood was shed so that we might have life everlasting. Thank you, God, for Jesus the Christ. Amen. In his letter to the Romans, Paul says to the people, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. By giving to neighbors in need, one of the special offerings of the United Church of Christ, you are doing just that. The Neighbors in Need offering supports a variety of ministries rooted in justice and compassion, including the UCC's Council for American Indian Ministry and our Justice and Witness Ministries. Grants are awarded to UCC congregations and organizations whose work ranges from direct services to community organizing and advocacy to address systematic injustice. This year, special consideration will be given to projects focusing on serving our immigrant neighbors and communities. Friends, this has been a challenging year for all of us, but the pandemic has been especially tough on immigrant and refugee communities, most of whom are ineligible for local, state, and federal support. At this time, I invite you to support the Neighbors in Need offering by giving joyously and generously through your local congregation or online at ucc.org. Thank you.
A reading from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of, stature of Christ. We must no longer be children, tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ from whom the body, joined and knitted together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth and building itself up in love. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce our preacher of the hour, the Reverend Dr. Karen Georgia A. Thompson, who is the Associate General Minister for Wider Church Ministries and Operations in the United Church of Christ and a co-executive for Global Ministries within the United Church of Christ and the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. She is an aspiring preacher, theologian, who shares her skills and gifts in a variety of settings nationally and internationally, often using her poetry as part of her ministry. As the Associate General Minister for Wider Church Ministries and Operations, Dr. Thompson provides strategic visioning and leadership for the programmatic ministries of global ministries, humanitarian aid and development, ecumenical and interfaith relations, events and scholarships management and archives. In collaboration with the other two elected officers of the United Church of Christ, they work together to fulfill the mandate of the General Synod and the United Church of Christ Board. Dr. Thompson has deep ecumenical expertise, which is evident in her leadership roles within the World Council of Churches, the Joint Working Group of the Roman Catholic Church, and the Commission for Education and Ecumenical Formation. Her other ecumenical elected leadership positions include Secretary of the National Council of Churches, Secretary Treasurer for the Caribbean and North American Area Council of the World Communion of Reformed Churches, and Treasurer for Churches Uniting in Christ. Dr. Thompson is a gifted writer and poet whose writings have been published in books, journals, and online publications. Her book of poetry, Drums in Our Veins, will be published in 2020 and is a compilation of the poems that focus on the injustices facing people of African descent and the fight and desire for racial justice globally. Born in Kingston, Jamaica, her poetry and writings reflect her Jamaican heritage and culture, as well as the traditions and lore of her ancestors. The Reverend Dr. Thompson, earned her Bachelor of Art from Brooklyn College in New York, a Master of Public Administration from North Carolina Central University in Durham, North Carolina, and her Master of Divinity from Union Theological Seminary in New York. She also studied public policy at Duke University and earned her doctorate in ministry at Seattle University. She is the mother of two sons and the grandmother of three grandchildren. It is my honor and pleasure again to present to you the Reverend Dr. Karen Georgia A. Thompson. Oh 
Potomac Association of the Central Atlantic Conference. Thank you so much for the invitation to be present with you on this World Communion Sunday. I am Reverend Dr. Karen Georgia Thompson, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Associate General Minister for Wider Church Ministries and as the Co-Executive for Global Ministries in the national setting of the United Church of Christ. Prior to answering this call to serve in the national setting, I served for eight years as the ecumenical officer for the United Church of Christ. As such, it is indeed a double pleasure to be present with you on this, which is one of the most ecumenical Sundays in our liturgical calendar as we celebrate together World Communion Sunday. I'm grateful for the opportunity to join you, grateful to celebrate with you the one body of Christ and I bring you greetings on behalf of the staff at 700 Prospect in the National Setting of the United Church of Christ. Please join me in prayer. Holy God, creator of all we know, you are the breath that unites us as people and as your church. We are grateful for your word, which has already been received in song and the scriptures. We experience your presence in the faces we see on this screens, the voices we heard and the love we feel across the miles. We ask that you open our hearts to receive your word given to us in this moment. And we ask, Holy God, that you grant us the boldness and courage to live in the moment of obedience to the calling you have placed before us. And we ask, O oh God, that as we join hearts and minds in this moment, that the words of our mouth and the meditations of all our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. The title of this sermon is Living as One. Now, in my immediate family, I consider us a small family. I grew up with uh, two brothers and a sister. So it was just really the six of us in my family along with our parents. And even in a small family, we had a variety of opinions and interests. We did not see eye to eye on any number of issues, even as children. And where most of it was concerned, we actually learned to agree to disagree about things that we just couldn't come to consensus on. Our family is much bigger now. I have three additional siblings. So we're now seven siblings. We have children and grandchildren, and each one comes with a different set of wants, needs, and opinions. Even my four-year-old granddaughter does. She knows exactly what she wants and she knows how to get it. We are as diverse as we are similar. And sometimes it is challenging to understand how we came from the same parents, the same lineage, and hold such differing opinions. Yet, we hold a common value. And that is that we are a family. As a family unit, we have learned to live as one. My siblings and I, along with our progeny, are part of a much larger clan. My father was one of four children. My mother was one of 13. At last count, I had identified 210 relatives on my family tree. In some places, that's the size of a congregation. Now, if six people in a family can generate multiple divergent opinions, imagine 
what that looks like in a family of 210 people and how much more so in the body of Christ and with the family and people that we are as children of God. Our congregations are a small part of this body of Christ. And what then of the global Christian family? Yet we have committed somehow to living as one. Living as one is not easy. In the United Church of Christ, we continue to say, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. People have heard us and they have joined us. They heard us and decided to join us and we are not all the same. We have different opinions. You know what they say about us in the UCC. If there are two UCC people in a room, there are six opinions, perhaps even 12. We are theologically diverse. We are politically diverse. We are intergenerational. We represent the wide diversity that is race, gender, sexuality, culture, heritage, and other forms of self-identification. We are urban and rural. We are small and large churches. We have wealthy congregations, and we have those that are struggling economically. We are diverse. World Communion Sunday is an ecumenical moment that invites us to celebrate our unity in the life of the church. We are encouraged to see the ways in which our unity draws us together in Christian witness and mission. Our unity in no way implies uniformity. In fact, our unity is strengthened by our diversity with no expectations of uniformity or conformity for that matter. This is the commitment to living as one, as one body of Christ. It encourages us to be authentic in our commitments, authentic in our self-understandings, authentic in our lived expression of what it means to be Christian. In the Ephesians text, the unity of the body of Christ is the focus of chapter four. There is one body, the writer says, and one spirit, just as you are called to one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. That's in verses four through six. This is a vision of oneness that sees the church, this body of Christ, beyond its human nature and condition. In her reflection on this particular Ephesians passage, Catherine Matthews wrote the following. Our passage today is a moving reminder to us in the United Church of Christ of who we are and who we are called to be as followers of Jesus, to understand what we are living for. Within our congregations, we are called to be one, to be reconciled, to be strong, to strive, to be worthy of our calling. This is what it means to live as one. We must be focused on what we are living for. We want to be the church, a living example of Christ's presence here on earth. We want to be the salt and light that Jesus called, up to be, called us to be, elements that make a difference in the world. We want to be healers amidst the brokenness and dis-ease that we see in the world. We want to be prophetic voices and witnesses to the peace of God given to all and for all. We want to be the best that we can for each other and we want the best for each other. We want to ensure that all can live in peace with human rights, with dignity, with freedom, and with respect. The tears of the brokenhearted should motivate us to ensure that their pain and suffering is heard and alleviated. 
Living as one in the body of Christ means that we want to seek that no part, that absolutely no part of the body is hurting. Our unity pushes us to live with the understanding that we are all a part of the same body. And when one part of the body hurts, we all hurt. Today, as we take communion, we do so with the full knowledge and reminder that we break the bread and drink of the cup with millions around the world on this Sunday. And we do so every single Sunday. When we gather, we are, we are joined together, committed in our faith, breaking bread together. For a full 24 hours, as we cycle around the globe, we will break bread together across time zones and distance, united as one in the body and love of God. Matthew's further notes that the text should motivate us to walk the talk. She writes, how easy it is to think that talking and proclaiming are all there is to it. How much more difficult it is to live a life worthy of our calling in humility, gentleness, patience, and forbearance. Very little in our culture, she says, exhorts, supports, or even permits us to lift up such virtues when the goal of life is to acquire everything we can and to get ahead of everyone else. To walk the talk means that we are willing to love as God called us to love with an extravagant love. It means that we are going to be willing to give with generosity that is rooted in Christ's love. And it means that we are willing to see others the way that we see ourselves, to desire for others what we desire for ourselves, because that is what God has called us to do and to be. It is to live as one, to feel and to experience God beyond ourselves, God manifested in the world, God seen as imagio Dei in the face of the other. This is who we are called to be. This is what we are called to do when we are called to live as one. We are called to walk the talk. That the things that we say that we are, we should be able to live them. That the freedoms that we hold for ourselves, we should hold for others. Walk the talk. So living as one is this challenge to walk the talk. What we say and what we do regarding the unity of the body of Christ is more than a Sunday morning experience. It is more than walking through common doors or sitting in matching pews back months ago when that is what going to church meant. In these days, when the church has left the building and the common elements of our faith are expressed beyond the walls of the church, living as one is even more important. We are not seeing each other as much as we used to. Our opportunities to see each other are in this virtual reality. The personal of touch and presence is far removed for many. And yet, even in this moment, we are reminded that we are united as one in Christ's love. We are connected more now than ever through the bonds of the spirit. On this communion Sunday, this one especially, know that wherever you are, Christ's love connects you to Christians in the United States and all over the world. Know that you are connected to this body of Christ. And while our culture may not exhort, support, or even permit us, as Matthew says, to live a life that is worthy of our calling, the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit motivates us to live lives that connect us with a world that needs the light and the salt 
that we have been given for this journey. So take the bread and drink the cup today and affirm your connection to the body of Christ. Take the bread and drink the cup, knowing that we are one in the spirit. Take the bread and drink of the cup, believing that God's love given freely to you is freely given to all. Take the bread and drink the cup, knowing that we are one body, one spirit, one God, one Lord of all. I want to close with the words of one of my favorite songs. One bread, one body, one Lord of all, one cup of blessing which we bless, and we, though many, throughout the earth, we are one body in this one Lord, Gentile or Jew, servant or free, woman or man, no more. One bread, one body, one Lord of all. One cup of blessing which we bless, and we though many throughout the earth, we are one body in this one Lord. Many the gifts, many the works, one in the Lord of all. That's who we are. We are one in the Lord of all. Let us walk the talk of what it means to be one in the spirit. Let us walk the talk, looking out for each other, loving and living as God has called us to live. And may God's peace be present with us as we journey together. Let the people say, Amen. the joyful feast of unity. Christ has gathered his people around the earth to come together at his table across political lines and economic lines in places of powerfully protected affluence and among the poorest of the poor. Together we share a meal. A meal of sourdough, rye, tortillas, crackers, wafers, white or wheat bread, a feast, enjoying different juices or wines, shared in simple, simple cups, pottery, chalices, or wine glasses. And yet, through God's power, this diverse meal unites us as one people, people remembering and celebrating the one who showed, who showed us peace is possible. In solidarity with Christ at this table, the evil structures of the world are transformed. And so come, you from the east and you from the west, from the north and from the south, you from the urban center of the nation's capital and from the rural farmland of Maryland, from the Beltway suburbs and from the shores of the Potomac River, from the hills of the wine country and from the streets of Richmond. Come, come with your doubts, come with your hopes, come with your prayers. Come with your inadequacies and with your strengths. Come, for this is a table where all are welcome and all are celebrated. Holy God, one of many names and faces, we thank you for the light and the darkness, for the division of waters and dry land. We thank you for creating us in your image to live connected with love to see you and others, to stretch from this table in this room across land and sea. Moses revealed your vision and commandments, and your people nurtured them in exile. Your prophets unleashed cries for justice, and still the earth rains, blows, burns, and cries for peace. Through long generations, we have ebbed and flowed 
with suffering and sorrow, healing and renewal. We ask for your forgiveness and grace again and again in the most beautiful and most oppressive of times. You still called us beloved. You are full of wonder and awe, O oh God. Your ways are just and prophetic. With all of creation in all times and places, with your people around your planet, we praise you in one voice. Praying the words that Jesus taught us, we say now, our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 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 Today we celebrate the gift of this table. We gather today knowing that the table draws us closer to God and closer to one another. We gather to commune as beloved friends, holding close the story of Jesus. Jesus came as human and divine to heal and encourage, to protect and nurture, to cultivate and guide. Jesus gathered with friends and crowds on mountaintops and in murky waters, on boats and at tables. Jesus came so we may know God. In his final week, Jesus said goodbye to his disciples and friends. He gathered them in a room for a final meal. In honor of him, we gather virtually now. In remembrance of him, we gather in covenant with communities across the globe. And for the love of him, we gather in spirit with all the saints. We remember that Jesus took bread. We remember that Jesus took bread. We remember that Jesus took bread. That he took a loaf of bread, that he broke it and gave thanks and said, This is my body broken for you. 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 Do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took a cup and said, This is the cup of the new covenant. This is the cup of the new covenant. Poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. Holy God, creator of milk and honey, of wheat and grapes. Over time, this table has been a symbol of restoration and community, a call to remembrance. Bless this time in celebration. Draw us into thanksgiving for the gift of receiving your holy welcome. And the powerful memory of the justice work of Jesus Christ. Amen. Your communion elements are now blessed and your place at Christ's table is set. You may now take communion yourself or share with those around you with words like, the bread of life or the body of Christ and the cup of blessing or the blood of Christ. Let us join together in this holy meal in covenant and in community with Christians from every time and place. As one body, we lament with those who lament. We hope with those who hope. We live with suffering. We live with beauty. Let us go from this table as a renewed community, doing the radical work of Jesus that calls us to live justice making lives of faith. We give thanks. Amen.
we're so glad that you were able to worship with us this morning as we come together on this World Communion Sunday, the many churches of the Potomac Association of the United Church of Christ. And now receive this benediction. Go with the God who goes before you always to guide you. Go with Jesus Christ who walks beside us every step of the way in solidarity and with love. And go with the Holy Spirit that swirls in and around and through you so that you can do amazing things out in this world to God's glory. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you.